Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I'm Dr. Brianne Wolf, and I teach political economy and political theory here at James Madison College. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the annual Hans Senholz Lecture in Political Economy at James Madison College at Michigan State University. And we are delighted to offer this lecture both in person and uh, virtually. I want to begin by telling you a little bit about uh, why we have this lecture before I introduce our speaker this evening. So John Blythe established the fund that supports this lecture to honor his devoted brother-in-law, Doctor of Dentistry John B. Mead, who is participating virtually tonight. John Mead was married to Jean Blythe Mead, John Blythe's younger sister. And Mr. Blythe stated, quote, he is the best brother-in-law I have ever been privileged to witness. And Dr. Mead had a longtime interest in Austrian school economics, largely because of the close friendship he and his wife Jean had with Hans and Mary Senholtz. And the Austrian School of Political Economy focuses on interactions in the market, broadly construed, and the order that results from these interactions. And so the Austrian tradition analyzes market signals like prices to understand how buyers and sellers make decisions and coordinate their actions, but also takes into account how social rules and customs inform choices and the resulting structures of the market and of society. John Mead stated that for 35 years, Hans and Mary Senholz were his mentors, friends, and travel companions, and he was also their dentist. Uh, Charles Amboy, who's here with us today, uh, worked out the particulars with Mr. Blythe and MSU, and now we have this excellent program honoring Professor Senholz and Mary Senholz in James Madison College, and we get to continue their discussion about political economy that was so central to their friendship with the Meads. I want to pause just for a moment of silence to remember John and Mary Blythe along with um, Jean Blythe Mead. And I also want to tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Hans Senholz. So Dr. Senholz received his PhD from New York University where he was Ludwig von Mises' first PhD student in the United States. He taught economics at Grove City College from 1956 until 1992 and was extremely dedicated to his undergraduate teaching much like we strive to be here at James Madison College. And after he retired, he became president of the Foundation for Economic Education and continued his commitment to educating young people in the principles of political economy. In his 37 years at Grove City College, he taught more than 10,000 students and wrote more than 1,000 books, booklets, articles, and received numerous awards and honorary degrees. And in addition to his work in Austrian economics and his teaching, he was a pilot during World War II and he often flew his own plane to lecture destinations across the country. And in fact, his friendship with the Meads was uh, cemented during many of the times that he flew them himself on his plane. And it was that friendship that makes possible the continued exchange of ideas about political economy in Professor Senholz's honor every year here at JMC. And so this lecture really helps to extend the work of the college um, where we try to study pressing issues in public affairs to better understand our role as engaged and reflective citizens. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight's lecture. Dr. Christopher Coyne is a professor of economics at George Mason University and the associate director of the F.A. Hayek program for advanced study in philosophy, politics, and economics at the Mercatus Center. He is also the co-editor of the Review of Austrian Economics and the Independent Review. Coyne is the author or co-author of several books, um, including most recently, In Search of Monsters to Destroy, the Folly of American Empire and the Paths to Peace, Manufacturing Militarism, U.S. Government Propaganda and the War on Terror, and a book on the subject of tonight's lecture, Tyranny Comes Home, Domestic Fate of U.S. Militarism. He is also the co-editor of several works, including the Oxford Handbook of Austrian Economics. In 2016, he was selected as a recipient of George Mason University's Teaching Excellence Award. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Coyne to James Madison College. Well, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. I, I, I never had the chance to, to meet uh, Hans Senholz, but I, I do have a connection to him, uh, which is that uh, my colleague, Pete Betke, uh, is uh, a professor of economics at George Mason. He went to Grove City as a uh, undergraduate and was influenced by Senholz. That's how he got into economics, and he attributes that to Senholz. But more than that, I knew Pete before he was at George Mason. He taught me as an undergraduate for one year at Manhattan College, and that's how I got excited and 
uh, not just about economics, but decided to dedicate my life to it. Uh, and so just like Senholz had that effect on Pete, Pete had that effect on me. Uh, in addition, of course, I was a, a product of the Foundation for Economic Education programs all the way back to when I was an undergraduate. And as Professor Wolf mentioned, uh, Hans Senholz was the, the president of, of uh, uh, FEE uh, as well. And so uh, the, the tradition and the connections run deep. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here with you to, to talk to you about this. You might wonder what's an economist doing talking about issues that typically fall under the purview of international relations and public policy. Uh, and there's a couple reasons why uh, an economist should talk about it. Number one, what I'm going to talk to you about, broadly construed, is an overlooked cost of foreign policy. And of course, economics is concerned with both the benefits and costs of policies. Uh, but also, as Professor Wolf mentioned, one of the things that I focus on and my colleagues is a very interdisciplinary view of, of the world, an interdisciplinary view of policy. Uh, and from that standpoint, uh, you can never understand economics in isolation. You also have, a, have to have a deep appreciation from a variety of insights from other fields, uh, political science, sociology, history, uh, and so on. Uh, if we hope to, to make any sense of the world, uh, we have to have a, a very interdisciplinary view. And so uh, that's, that's the how I approach these issues and, and what has led to uh, my study of these uh, topics. This book and, and several other projects I've worked on, I should mention, are co-authored uh, with, with a, a former student, now colleague, uh, Professor Abby Hall. She's a professor of economics now at uh, University of Tampa in, in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure I, I, I mentioned her as well because she was a uh, equal partner in this project, uh, as well as our ongoing research in this area. And the way I'm going to do this tonight, I'm going to break it into four kind of pieces. Hopefully it all flows in a quite linear fashion. And I'm going to talk about some background motivation to, to set the stage. I'm going to set up the, the theoretical framework, what, we, what Abby and I call the boomerang effect. I'm going to provide an illustration to you with the U.S. surveillance state, and then I'll conclude with some of the implications. And then we can open it up and talk about whatever it is that interests you, whether it's directly related to this or any other in, uh, topics that, that are of interest to you. And so let me begin uh, with some motivation. And uh, I, I swear the Madison quote was in here in this presentation before I, I came here. Uh, for those of you, I know some of you are reading the book, it's, it's in there. But I, I want to use this to motivate it because I really think it captures the, the salient features of what Abby and I are trying to get people to think about. And Madison and other people, Alexis de Tocqueville, they had a very, what I consider to be a very nuanced understanding of the benefits of, of uh, a proactive foreign policy in war, but also some of the potentially pernicious effects of that. And I won't read this to you, you can read it yourself, but the first half, or, or maybe two-thirds of it, what Madison points out is that there's fiscal effects of war. One of the, the real concerns with the government carrying out war is that there are fiscal effects in terms of debts and taxes that are associated with that. And he was worried that excessive war would place severe pressure on the fiscal aspects of the state and obviously then have real effects on, on domestic life. Uh, the second portion, though, starting with the in War II, so four lines from the bottom, what Madison points out is that during times of war, it places severe pressure on constitutional constraints. It expands the scope of government power. He highlights the executive branch here, but I would even go beyond that and just say, in general, war places significant pressure on constitutional constraints. And I think we see that throughout history, uh, both in the United States and elsewhere, that, that when a, a, a country is engaged in, in war, uh, oftentimes constitutional constraints and limitations are pushed by the wayside under the guise of, well, this is something that's extraordinary. This is a time that is not normal, so we can't be held back by constitutional constraints. And right there, in some sense, is the fundamental tension, because the very purpose of constitutions is to do what? It's to tie the hands of rulers. It's to tie their hands so that they can abuse the power that is bestowed upon them to engage in opportunism. And so when you, when you throw those shackles off and say, well, we can't be bogged down by constitutional rules, that opens the door to significant expansions, not just in the, in the scale, the size of government in terms of the fiscal size, that's the first portion, but also the scope. The 
uh, uh, the range of activities that are ac acceptable for governments to undertake. And that's what this whole project is about. It is to, to, to explore and study and think about how war making, both in terms of preparing for war, but then carrying out war, uh, increases the, the, the scope of government power in permanent ways uh, and what that means. And so if I had to summarize our argument to set this up and then I'll flesh it out a little bit, here's how I would summarize it to you in, in four bullet points. A proactive foreign policy. And so what's a proactive foreign policy? A proactive foreign policy is one where it typically is undertaken in the name of defense, but it's proactive in terms of it is outward focused. It is one where the government broadcasts power on others. Uh, and uh, it is one where it's not just that a government is carrying out foreign interventions during wartime, but also during peacetime. Uh, and this nicely describes the United States government, by the way. Uh, the United States government, certainly since the world's wars, uh, has had a permanent war economy, so a permanent preparation for future wars, and the United States government, for better or for worse, and, and that's an ongoing debate across disciplines, uh, has had a global presence. Uh, it is, uh, has an expansive network of bases, uh, 700 to 800 around the world that we know of. Uh, special operations in the United States are carried out in something like three-fourths of the world's countries on an annual basis. Most of the time you don't hear about this. You have to uh, look quite hard to find it. Uh, U.S. Congress rarely uh, actually carries out its constitutional duties of declaring war, which is situated with Congress purposefully to separate the power from the executive, which is what Madison was pointing out. Congress is supposed to declare war according to the U.S. Constitution because it's supposed to check the ability of the executive, a single person, to engage in adventures abroad. The U.S. government is the world's largest arms dealer, sells the most arms, oftentimes to terrible governments. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a, a, a number of other things the U.S. government does in terms of its interventions abroad. But it's very active. Uh, the, the problem with that is that oftentimes, when you prepare for and engage in foreign intervention, it returns home. And this is the idea of a boomerang. This is kind of the, the parallel we draw, is that if you, if you think about a well-thrown boomerang, it returns to the thrower. And from a very young age, at least I, and I imagine most of you, were taught that the U.S. government and the military and the national security state is crucial to upholding our freedoms and liberties, and that's what it does. And certainly it does some things to do those things. But it also can undermine those things. Uh, and for any of you who remember, not too long ago, the revelations by Edward Snowden, which I'll talk about later on, but also things that were precursors to that, uh, you know that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, that, that that same apparatus that can be used in principle to protect our liberties and freedoms as citizens uh, can be used to undermine it. And that's the tension. And again, that's a fundamental tension in political philosophy that has existed for centuries. And it's one that all of us who value freedom and liberty, irregardless of your political affiliation or ideology, has to wrestle with and deal with. And that's one of the things I hope to impress upon you this evening. So preparing for and engaging in foreign interventions serves as an, a laboratory. It serves as a, 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 a testing field, if you will, for governments to test out various ways of controlling people. And, and to demonstrate this is not just academic speak, I just by chance, I had already sent uh, my slides in, but two days ago, the New York Times had an article, and the headline, you can read it on your own if you want, was Western allies look to Ukraine as a testing ground for new weapons. And so one of the, the ways that governments do this is by preparing for and carrying out a proactive foreign policy. It's kind of a, a, a laboratory for them to test out new ways of controlling other people. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Under certain conditions, those innovations in controlling other human, peop uh, human beings return home. And when they return home, it serves as a way for our domestic government that is supposed to uphold our freedoms and liberties to undermine those very things. So let me flesh this out a little more. 
and then I'll provide an example. What does foreign intervention entail? At its core, it entails wanting to change the way other people live. That can be for good or bad, but that's what it entails. Notice if it didn't entail that, if policymakers were happy with the status quo in another society, there'd be no urge to intervene in the first place. The very urge to intervene, the desire to intervene is, I don't like what's happening there. I want to change it. So how do you change it? Well, you can ask people to change things, and perhaps they might voluntarily comply, uh, but often they don't, which means that at its core, foreign intervention requires force or the threat thereof. It requires tools to control other people, to get them to do what you want under the assumption that they won't do it voluntarily. Because if they would change voluntarily, you wouldn't have to intervene upon them. So that's what foreign intervention is at its core. And we should never forget that, by the way. Uh, uh, Americans, and if you, if you look at public opinion polls, you see this, Americans are, are highly supportive of the U.S. military and U.S. military policy. And that's fine as far as it goes, but one of the risks you run is, turn, is being blind to the way that that military instrument is used. And that can be problematic both in terms of upholding liberal values, and I use liberal here in the classical sense of, sense of the term, but also in terms of the very members of the military themselves. Because after all, they're the ones that incur the costs of, of having to go abroad and intervene in other societies. They're the ones that are, whose lives and well-being are put at risk in terms of carrying this out, which to my way of thinking necessitates an extremely careful and critical assessment of whether we are utilizing that instrument appropriately, as well as, uh, of course, the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who live abroad. And again, that can be to help them, but oftentimes it can be to hurt people as well. And we always want to keep that in mind. So keep that in the back of your mind, what foreign intervention entails. Every single time you hear any politician, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, talk about foreign intervention, never forget what it is at its core. It is the threat to use force or the use of force against other human beings. And it's a very blunt instrument. It's, 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 it's much more like a shotgun than like a laser, meaning that even if there's bad people doing bad stuff, you might get the bad people, but you're probably going to have a lot of collateral damage as well. And for anyone that paid attention to what was going on in Afghanistan, that's exactly what you saw. We got some bad people, but a lot of innocent people were harmed along the way. And that's something we need to take into account and think about. So now that we've talked about what foreign intervention entails, let's think about how it can return home, because that's our focus for this evening. And there's really two things that set the stage for this, and then I'll talk about three channels that can actually bring tyranny over other people home over us. So what are the two enablers? Number one is citizen fear. Citizen fear is at the root of almost all expansions in government power. When citizens fear government, excuse me, when citizens fear some outcome and they turn to government as the solution, as the only source of order, it opens the door for government to do lots of things. That sounds very straightforward, but we don't tend to think of things that way. We tend to think about government being almost like a parent who has to take care of us. And that lets our guard down. And if you go back to Madison, you go back to the, many of the other founders, and you go back to political theorists in general, when they talk about constraining government, one of the things they always highlight is a skepticism on the part of the citizenry. Because the minute you let down your guard and you turn to government like a child turns to a parent, that skepticism is gone. You are accepting of government. Now. Uh, government is not a passive player in this. Governments throughout history have worked hard, including governments in constitutionally constrained democracies, to cultivate fear. Uh, you saw that during COVID. You saw that during the war on terror. Uh, and, and although not my focus this evening, we can talk about it during, during the Q&A. Uh, I just want to say something briefly about the war on terror, since many of you, even the students here, are, are, can remember it, where, where prior to that, Cold War, World War II, 
Those seem like artifacts in many ways. Uh, the War on Terror, as the name implies, uh, was largely a shell game. And what do I mean by that? The idea that you can have a war on terror uh, really makes no sense, since terror is a psychological state uh, of, uh, 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 of fear creation by some threat. You can never defeat that. In, in other words, a war is something you can win. There's an enemy. Uh, fear is a, a psychological state. But it's also been with us since time immemorial. Uh, it's not something that just started in 2001. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that's number one. Number two, very rarely, and we have multiple administrations, this is a bipartisan phenomenon in the United States, very rarely talked about the realities of the war on terror. And I mean that from, a, from, from scientific facts that we know. What do I mean by that? We know the statistical probability of an American being caught in a terrorist attack, and it is minuscule. You have a higher chance of dying, being struck by lightning, drowning in a bathtub, uh, having a deer run across the road while you're driving, uh, all of those things, and of course just driving in general. All of those things are a much more significant risk than dying in a terrorist attack. Doesn't mean that it's zero to die in a terrorist attack. There's some probability of it, but it's quite low. But if you listen to policymakers, across both political parties in the United States, you would get the sense that there's a terrorist around every corner. Uh, and that enabled, because of the fear it created, a massive expansion in state power. From the Patriot Act to the creation for the d of the Department of Homeland Security uh, and so on uh, down the line. And that's just one example of this type of phenomena. The second is state consolidation. Foreign policy is carried out by the national government. That's what the founders bestowed the national security powers in the federal government. But we also are supposed to have a, a federalist type structure where there's a division of powers across government units. The reason, again, is to separate powers, to serve as a check on concentration of powers. That's the idea behind it. What happens when we grant government powers, the federal government, the national government, power to carry out more foreign policy? They get more power. They get more resources, they get more control over both foreign and domestic life. And again, you saw this during the War on Terror. Uh, if you want an example in passing, there's something called Joint Terrorism Task Forces, which were partnerships between the federal government and local governments. And this just integrated state governments and local governments with the federal government. And of course, the federal government ran the show. If you're concerned or know about the militarization of police, that is the transfer of military equipment that flows through the federal government down to local police departments. You might think that's a good thing. I'm not passing judgment on that right now. What I am saying is, irregardless of where you fall down on it, that phenomena requires an integration of the local and the national. As that happens, it by definition grants expanding powers to the national level government over the local level, which erodes that separation of powers. That is a cost of it. To the extent you are concerned with the centralization of, of government power, like Madison and others were, you can see why that's troubling. So those are the two enablers that set the stage. We have citizen fear and acquiescence, and we have state consolidation of power. So then how does stuff come back? How does the, the social control that is projected abroad return home? And there's three things. Number one, human capital. The minute you engage in foreign intervention, someone has to carry it out. Human capital is an economist speak for skills and knowledge. All right, it's the skills and knowledge people develop. And certain people who carry out foreign policy become experts in state-produced social control. They become experts in controlling other people. Presumably, if you want a military or national security state, I just don't want to limit it to the military, I want the national security state in America is enormous, by the way. You want people that are good at that, but that requires a certain set of skills. It requires controlling other people, surveilling other people, imprisoning other people, torturing other people. You are human beings. Now you might say, well, we need that, but presumably you want it to stay over there. You don't want to do it to citizens. The question is, can it remain over there? And that's what we want to think about. So what happens then when the people that gain these skills, when the foreign intervention ends? 
Well, they don't just disappear. One of the insights in economics is that people who gain skills tend to work in areas where their skill sets are well developed and tend to earn a higher wage in those areas because they have skills that make them more productive. And the same goes for being experts in social control. Let me give you a very clear example. I'm from Northern Virginia, okay, so right outside Washington, D.C. If you go look at all the major people in the Pentagon and what they do after they leave, retire, they end up in Arlington, Virginia, unless they retire and literally retire and, 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 and leave working. They end up in Arlington, Virginia. And what do they do? They start something like McChrystal Consulting Group. That's General Stanley McChrystal. And what does McChrystal uh, a Consulting Group do? They consult with the national security state. And what do they consult on? All the stuff that he worked on and gained skills and knowledge of during his decades as part of the U.S. national security state. I mean, this isn't crazy or shocking. If you went into finance and you worked in finance and you were really good at it, presumably that's what you would do for your career. If the, what you develop skills in is controlling other people, that's what you're going to do with your life, at least for some set of the people. So that affects the administrative and organizational dynamics. They bring home these tools, and that affects the way they perceive the relationship between the state and the citizen. It perceives what they view their role as, and it perceives the way that they shape government organizations, either as a member of those government organizations or as a contractor, a private contractor that partners with government. And then the final one, so we have uh, human capital, we have the integration of that human capital into domestic life, and then we have physical capital. Physical capital are simply the tools that we use. This microphone's a piece of physical capital. It's any physical item that we use as an input to do stuff. So if you learn how to use military equipment really well to control people, and you come home and you try to control people, you'll use that domestically. So again, here's one example. I don't want to overlap the surveillance case I'm going to talk about. Just think about SWAT teams. I talked about the militarization of police, which started as SWAT teams. SWAT teams started 60s into the 70s. California was the first SWAT team. And what was the first SWAT team? Vietnam veterans. The very purpose of the SWAT teams, so there were riots, race riots, and the local police said, we don't have the tools and skills to keep these rioters under control. So we need a special force that will only be used in the most extreme circumstances, we promise. So they got Vietnam vets who had military training, and they created the first SWAT team to, for the very purpose of using military tactics and organization, only in these extreme examples. Uh, either in the book we talk about this, or you can just look it up on your own. Look uh, uh, around at the number of SWAT teams around the country. It is enormous and they are not used in extraordinary circumstances. They're used like things to carry out no-knock raids for drug warrants. Uh, and these are not like threats to national security, all right, regardless of where you fall down on the war on drugs. And you can go look up the numerous cases of the absolute uh, terrifying uh, mistakes that are made, uh, where they go in with these no-knock warrants and uh, uh, shoot people uh, 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 the wrong people, oftentimes, uh, and, and harm innocent babies and kids because they'll go in and throw flash grenades or a parent will come out. Just like you and I, if someone kicked in our front door because a no-knock raid, as the name implies, you don't have to announce yourself. They don't want you to destroy the evidence. That's the logic behind it. And so they kick in the front door and all of a sudden you have a bunch of people with machine guns and military-grade equipment running in your house. If you have a gun in your house or you're startled in general, you tend to try to defend your family. They view that as a threat against the police, and they shoot you. Uh, uh, and, and this has happened numerous times. And of course, they are, uh, they are uh, uh, not liable uh, for this kind of stuff. So that's the kind of logic. So let me provide you with an illustration. Again, I, I never learned about any of this stuff in my history books, uh, certainly as a, as a, in, in grade school, high school, college, uh, or even later in my life until I actually started reading about it. Uh, here's someone that. Uh, very few people, I've, ne I've never actually met someone that knew about them um, who works, who doesn't work in the surveillance state in the United States. His name's Ralph Van Diemen. He's a very important person in U.S. history. The reason why is he was a key player in the U.S. occupation of the Philippines in the uh, late 1800s. So the U.S. intervenes in the Philippines. 
They, grant, they said they were going to grant them independence, but they didn't grant them independence. As you can imagine, people in the Philippines were quite upset about this, so they started uh, uh, pushing back against the U.S. military occupiers, and then they got into a war. It's the U.S.-Philippine War because they had to squash the insurgency. It is the first war in U.S. history where, in addition to using physical force, which they did, they deployed information warfare. And so what Ralph Van Diemen was, by today's terms, this would be considered extremely rudimentary, but at the time it was state-of-the-art. He started intercepting communications among the insurgents, collecting information, and using uh, information to manipulate people in the insurgency. All right? And uh, he comes back to the United States in 1902, uh, and, and uh, he's known by the, by the moniker for people who know the father of U.S. military intelligence. So I'm saying he's an important figure in, in, the, in U.S. history. And he has an unpub unpublished memoir online, uh, which is available for public download. And in there he says, when I got back, I wanted to set up a similar apparatus here in the United States. I wanted to set up an apparatus just like I did in the, in the Philippines, because I realized this was a great way uh, for the state to control people without engaging in physical violence against them. If I have information on people, uh, I can use it uh, to control them. Uh, and so he worked. Uh, for, uh, it took him a while uh, to get it set up. It was World War I that provided the opportunity for him to do this. Uh, and uh, in 1917, uh, the military in intelligence section was established. MI8 is the key branch of that. For, for our purposes, it's called the Black Chamber. The Black Chamber, it was like a group of five people. It's very, very small. But what they did is they set up a fake storefront in New York City, I believe, and they um, partnered with Western Union. Now, we, to the extent you even know Western Union, you probably think of it like a place you can go cash checks and take out like a payday loan. At one point, they controlled like 85% uh, of the cables for communications in, in and out of the United States. And so what the MI8 did was they went, without a warrant or anything, to um, uh, Western Union and said, we want access to all the telecommunications coming out of the United States. And so in 1917, uh, 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 they, the, the, a, a small group of members of the U.S. national security state were monitoring all communications coming in and out of the United States in the name of national security. Like any government bureau, uh, this goes through numerous iterations and rebrandings and renamings and different organizational charts, uh, and it ends up in the, na in the uh, National Security Agency, uh, 1952. That's the most recent reiteration of it through all these things, and I was amazed to find that, you know, the, these operations have been going on since the Philippines. Uh, and um, in addition to the NSA, you had the uh, CIA and the FBI, all right? And uh, all of these organizations have a very long history of domestic surveillance. Again, for, I don't know why we don't talk about this more in, in, in school, maybe, maybe where you went to school you did, but I knew very little about this. I, I, I got exposed a little bit to parts of it, but Certainly not in the detail that uh, uh, I think would have been useful. Uh, the, w the reason, uh, to the extent Americans know about this, it's because of an investigative journalist by the name of Seymour Hirsch. Uh, uh, Seymour Hirsch uh, is an investigative journalist who published a, uh, a very important article in the New York Times in 1974. It's on the cover. And uh, uh, what you had was, what he revealed is that the CIA had been violating its charter. The CIA's charter uh, uh, says that it is not allowed to operate on domestic soil. It is not a tool that can be used against U.S. citizens. The FBI can do things domestically. The CIA is not. But they were. Uh, they were, so was the FBI and so was the NSA, by the way. Who are they mainly intervening upon? The civil rights movement and anti-war movement, those who were against the Vietnam War. The other big thing which I don't have in here was Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg is one of the most famous whistleblowers in the history of the United States. By the way, he's a PhD economist, a famous PhD economist. There's something called the Ellsberg Paradox in Game Theory. So he's legit on the pure academic margin. But he uh, uh, took something called the, what are called the Pentagon Papers and released them publicly. And the Pentagon Papers showed that the U.S. government had been systematically lying to the U.S. Citizen, citizenry about the Vietnam War. Uh, and that went to the Supreme Court. So even if you don't care about anything I'm saying it's, and you, uh, about the specifics, 
It's a very famous Supreme Court case about free speech because it was, the, the, the case was the US government tried to block the press from publishing the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and then to go after uh, uh, Ellsberg uh, uh, under the Espionage Act, uh, and, um, which was passed in 1970, 1917 originally. In any case, the Supreme Court just said that the press could publish the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and uh, that's considered a major, a major um, landmark case in free speech. But in any case, the, what came out of this was something called the Church Committee. The Church Committee is named after Senator Frank Church, who was, I believe, a Democrat from either Iowa or Idaho, one of the I states. Uh, and uh, uh, what they uncovered was truly staggering. This is why, in some sense, the Snowden revelations were just repeats with better technology. It's not like this, you know, the, when this stuff happens, the, the US policymakers, whenever whistleblowers release stuff, here's what happens. Uh, they they badmouth the whistleblowers, so they're anti-American, blood on their hands, and then a few bad apples. It's never like a systematic thing. Yeah, some stuff happened, but it was just a few bad people. Uh, but not always. Uh, oftentimes, it's quite systematic. So again, if, if you're not familiar with this, uh, you can look these up on your own time. But I, I just want to say that uh, uh, it is truly staggering what these agencies were doing. The amount of information they were collecting on US citizens uh, uh, the, they were literally breaking and entering, and in addition to collecting information over, you know, uh, communi electronic communications, they were breaking and entering into people's homes to collect information. They were planting uh, evidence to get people arrested. Uh, and uh, uh, truly staggering. There's other uh, interesting things, too, which, again, sound like they're out of a movie. So there's something called Project, uh, uh, or excuse me, Operation MK Ultra. Uh, go check it out if you don't know about it. It is uh, uh, LSD, so drugging people and engaging in human experimentation on people, uh, American citizens, among others, uh, in the name of uh, mind control, by the way. So the U.S. government for a while really believed that you could, there's a segment of people in the U.S. government that believed that you could uh, use psychic powers to control your enemy to get them to do what you wanted, and that was... Uh, uh, at the core of this. And so they were, they were, in addition to the LSD and the drugging and stuff, they were hiring like uh, uh, fortune tellers and stuff, psychics, to, to, to try to train to figure out how to manipulate people. Uh, and then there's something called Operation Mockingbird. If you've never heard of it, that is a large-scale propaganda campaign where the U.S. government partnered with journalists. Uh, uh, mainstream, popular, there's no Twitter at this time. Uh, the, you know, there, there's the, the major news outlets. Uh, and to plant stories, to, to plant stories about uh, U.S. military operations in order to get U.S. citizens to be supportive and to keep them in the dark regarding what their government was doing. These are all the things that the Founding Fathers, but even before the Founding Fathers, people that had been thinking about the, the concerns about centralizing government power had been warning about. Uh, and so. Uh, here's a few quotes from the Church Committee reports. They're all publicly available. It's like six volumes. They're quite dense. But I want you just to take into account what they were saying. They're basically saying that this is the Church Committee, by the way, right? So it's not, this isn't recent. Well, it's decades ago, so, but it's not like during the War on Terror. Basically, the United States had turned into an authoritarian government. It had thrown off constitutional constraints. It was treating the citizenry. Remember, the, the, the fascinating part about the American project is that it flipped over the relationship between the state and, the, and, the, and citizens from almost all of human history. Throughout most of human history, there's the political leaders and there's the people, and the people serve the political leaders, whether that's based on just state conquest or religious grounds or whatever. The really fascinating part about the American project is it flipped that over. Members of the political elite serve the citizenry. They serve at our request, not the other way around. But what this kind of stuff does is it reverses that. The citizenry become the enemy. The citizenry are the ones that need to be controlled. And the political elite become the controllers. So it flips over the very foundations of the democratic self-governing project that is at the core at least of the American vision. Uh, this is a, a, a quote from Senator Church when, uh, on Meet the Press, so you can find the video online. And he says, look, 
you don't understand the magnitude, and this is 1970s, you don't understand the magnitude of the surveillance apparatus. Uh, if, if someone took over who was a bad person and got control of this, uh, there'd be no place for American citizens to escape. Uh, and, and so now I want you to think about this, but in light of the technologies that exist today. The technology, the technological power that exists today uh, dwarfs what existed in 1970s. And in many ways, that does a lot of good things for us. It allows us to have access to goods and services that we otherwise wouldn't have access to. It allows people to customize goods and services to make our lives better off. But all that data collection, what oftentimes is called big data, also is accessible to the security state. Now, that might be all fine and good as long as you are confident that benevolent people are in charge. Uh, but uh, perhaps they, they aren't or they won't always be. And that's the concern you have to have. So what comes out of the church committee? Something called the FISA court. The FISA court is named after uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. So FISA is the shorthand for that. And the FISA court uh, is a one-sided court, meaning it's secretive. And it's supposed to be a court where the government has to go in order to get a warrant to surveil people. So it was an attempt to put in place a check on the surveillance state. Then Snowden comes with his revelations. All right, now, I know Snowden's a very controversial figure. People either love him or think he's the worst thing ever. It's, it doesn't matter for the purposes of my discussion. He revealed information. And among that information is basically that the national security state ignored the FISA court. They just went right around them. And they started to collect, they were collecting people's information they were tapping into the databases of private firms to get access to inf information. In some cases, they partnered with the private firms. They forced major technology providers and, and data centers to uh, introduce backdoors so that they could have access when they wanted to. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, they were doing the same thing that was being done during the church committee investigations, but as I mentioned, uh, with uh, much more powerful information. I mean, technology, pardon me. And this continues today. Going back to the physical capital channel, how physical capital returns home, there's something called stingrays. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but uh, uh, we, there could be a stingray outside right now and we wouldn't know about it. A stingray looks like a suitcase. And these things are relatively recent innovation. They were actually invented during the war on terror for use in Afghanistan and Iraq. And what the stingray is, it's a, it's a, it, it mimics a cell phone tower. And so when the possessor turns it on, it forces cell phones to ping off that device. And it collects information about ingoing and outgoing messages that you send from your phone uh, uh, and location. Not precise location, general location. And there's no way to focus on just one person. So you might say, well, we gotta watch Chris, he's suspect. If they had it on, all of your cell phones would be directing to that. So police departments have this. It doesn't require a warrant to do it. There's non-disclosure agreements in place, and so they can't even reveal that they have them. The only reason we know about them is because of certain FOIA requests which have pieced this stuff together, but we don't know the magnitude. But they are in the United States, uh, and they are used by police. Uh, and we have evidence uh, that they are uh, not just used in the United States, but the cost of them oftentimes falls upon marginalized groups of people. Uh, one of the reasons being because those people that fall into those groups don't have the resources oftentimes to get legal representation to push back against it. Uh, and so uh, that's something to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing is, is that Americans have gotten so desensitized to government watching everything we do uh, that uh, it's not even front page news anymore. So uh, this is from 2021. The FBI was doing the same things they did during the Snowden revelations, the same things they did during the church committee. And I could find like two articles on this, Bloomberg and this, and I couldn't find anything else. I was looking around I'm like, well, certainly someone in Congress must have said something and gotten like upset about this or done some investigation. Nothing I could find. So maybe I missed it, uh, but I couldn't even find any other news stories on it. it kind of just went by the wayside, like, oh, I guess they're doing what they always do. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Again, to the extent you're worried about this stuff, uh, that seems to be a problematic. 
seems to be a reason for concern. And so what are the implications to sum up? Number one, might seem obvious, but I, I want you to think about it. The costs of foreign interventions are understated. There's monetary costs and there's non-monetary costs. Even the non-monetary costs are, are understated, by the way. Always, always governments understate the monetary costs of war. You, got, you don't probably remember this because you might not have been born, but when the United States government intervened in Afghanistan and Iraq, you can go back and look this up, the George W. Bush administration said, don't fret. Uh, at most, this is gonna cost a couple billion dollars. Oil's gonna pay for it. Uh, and offset the cost, so there's going to be very little to no cost, and we're going to be in and out in a matter of months. Uh, and that was the pitch. That sounds like a nice deal. We're going to get the bad guys, be greeted as libera liberators, will cost you nothing. Uh, that's not true. Trillions of dollars, you can go look at the cost of war project at Brown, that you, your kids, probably your grandkids, will be paying for still. Uh, weren't greeted as liberators, unclear what the return on investment was, uh, and you can argue a massive undermining of domestic liberties. The things I was talking about, but if you haven't, go look up the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was passed very quickly without almost no congressional discussion debate in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. And that is the foundation for all of these expans expansions in surveillance powers and many others. Uh, access to people's financial records, even their health records, in the name of protecting your freedoms and liberties. And that's one of the real challenges and something you all need to think about as a citizen participant in a free society, or what we want to be a free society. What you're willing that trade-off to be. I've met, now, I give talks a lot on this stuff, and I've met a lot of people who will say, well, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I have nothing to hide. Therefore, I'm okay with government to having access to that. And that's certainly one way to frame it. But, you know, there's a, a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher by the name of David Hume uh, who made many important contributions. But one of the things Hume pointed out, uh, something today it's called Hume's political maxim. And it goes something like this. When we're thinking about constitutional rules, this is Hume speaking, uh, assume that the knave is in charge. And by knave, he means uh, a bad person. All right? So that's not an end-all, be-all for answering every policy question, but it's a good thought experiment. Rather than, no matter where you fall ideologically, any policy, one thought experiment is, my people are going to be running the show, so I'm going to get the outcome I want. And they're good people. Maybe, but your people aren't always going to be in power. And I, as a thought experiment, think about your least desirable politician. It can either be a real person or some ideal type. And then ask yourself, if that person had control over this policy, would I want that policy? That's one thought experiment, not the only aspect of the decision-making process, but it's a good way to check your thought. And I think for this type of thing, it's a good thing to, to think about. The Constitution's not going to protect you. That's the other thing I want to mention. By itself, constitutions don't protect rights. Because constitutions are enforced by people, and they have to be interpreted by people. It's not that constitutions don't matter. By themselves, they are not going to protect your rights. What ultimately is required is the citizenry. And that's the really hard part of a free society. It places a large burden on us, on us, the people that have to live under that government. Because to the extent, and go back to the enablers I talked about, to the extent that we are so fearful of things that we say, government, please do that, government's going to do it. And it doesn't go away. And it becomes a normalized part of life. I know there's a, a variety of ages in this room. Some of us will remember pre-9-11 how airport security was. Some people might even remember how airport security was in the 70s. Uh, I don't remember that. I'm not that old, but in any case, I've read about it. My kids, who are 3 and 10, will never know how airport security was pre-9-11. So to them, normal will be what was, would have been pre-9-11 considered not just obnoxious, but a gross violations of civil liberties. 
if, if people who are part of airport security did what they do now, pre-9-11, there would have been a, a massive uprising. And now it's just a normal part of life. And that's just one aspect of it. And that's the problem. Stuff becomes normalized, it becomes precedent. And once you get these expansions in government power, it's not impossible to go back, but it's really hard because the, the fabric of domestic life has, has changed. And that, I think, is one of the things that Madison was trying to get us to think about and appreciate, and one that I hope that you'll think about and appreciate, irrespective of where you ultimately fall down on your ultimate policy position regarding these matters. Thank you very much, uh, and I hope that we uh, can talk about whatever it is that, that interests you, but thank you. Chris, so um, now we'll take questions. You'll notice there's a mic in the uh, middle of the room here. So if you'll say your questions into the mic, that would be great so that our friends watching at home can also hear your wonderful questions and insights. For much, uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I had a question. Is there anything um, that was within the content of your book that you didn't get to incorporate into this talk that you think is a worthwhile inclusion, something we should know? Well, thank you. I, there, there's four case studies in the book. There's this, the militarization of police, the use of drones, and torture. Uh, and uh, uh, I still think all those things work well uh, as examples. I think they're kind of depressing, but I think they work well. But I, you know, I, if I was updating it or changing it today, I would simply add in the, the, the numerous other examples that have emerged since we wrote the book. We wrote the book, uh, Abby and I wrote the book starting in 2016 and then it was published in 2018. But for, for those of you, for instance, and, and here's a perfect example about why this matters on domestic soil. So you had the George, George Floyd murders and then you had the protests throughout the country. Uh, the governments, local governments in many cases, not the federal government, used many of these techniques to surveil protesters. And I'm not talking about violent protests. One of the parts of a free society is that you, have, you as citizens have the right to peacefully protest. That is a staple of a free and democratic society. So you can read examples of, of drones being used. The, the uh, Customs and Border Patrol has access to drones. And very few people know this, 100 miles within the border, so within the, the border of the United States, uh, there is significant slack in constitutional rules and, and custom border control because it's considered part of the border. By the way, two thirds of the US population live within 100 miles of the border. If you just think about all the major cities, if you just trace your finger around the, the map of the United States, that makes sense. Uh, it doesn't mean that they can do whatever they want, but they have significant ability to surveil people, to detain people, uh, to go on people's property, uh, uh, even under the guise of suspicion. So I would include that stuff uh, and expand there. And the other interesting thing, which we don't do in this book, but I, 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 I would want to look at is the application to other countries as well. So we, were, we, we focused on the United States, uh, but looking at places in Europe and stuff like that, I think I would to think about as well. Uh, and so uh, those are some of the things I, I think Abby and I would talk about. Hi, so first I'd like to say thank you. It was a fantastic lecture, and um, I'd like to say I haven't read your book, but I'm very curious into maybe purchasing it and getting into it, as uh, a lot of the words you were saying were provided words to the thoughts I had myself, so thank you. But um, I was just curious, um, maybe if you could provide some of your insight on the Nicaraguan Contra Fair. I feel like that is very much in tune with everything we've been talking about, especially with when it comes to whistleblowers with Gary Webb's Dark Alliance, and especially when we're talking about the technological aspect of that, um, you know, that popular online article being um, gaining notoriety based off of uh, the internet forming um, and really ramping up in the early 90s. And I was just curious if, um, what were your thoughts on that come in the context of everything else you've been speaking about? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I, I say this in that case, from what I know about it, there was no direct return home of of social control, but. The United States government, I mean, you gotta, you know, here's the thing. 
and, and, it, and it gets difficult oftentimes to talk about because people have a knee-jerk reaction to it. Here's what you got to get your head around. Anytime you centralize state power and you don't have constraints, people are going to abuse power. It's really that simple. Doesn't matter who's in control, doesn't matter what you call it, that's what happens across time and space. The United States government has done a lot of bad things. Why I personally find this troubling, number one, because I am concerned when governments or people in general do bad things to other human beings, but also I value the American project and what that American project stood for and its fundamental values. And those, those values of individual rights, uh, human rights, human dignity, and much of what the United States government has done when it comes to foreign policy is fundamentally at odds with those things. And I think we should admit it and recognize it. It's very hard to do, and you see that right now with Ukraine. You know, I was somewhat optimistic, even though the, the exit from Afghanistan, which I, I personally give Joe Biden and his administration massive props for, for getting out. And I, I, by the way, Donald Trump, for all his faults, set the stage for that, bring that discussion putting that discussion on the table even though he wasn't able to get out of it. It was always going to be messy to get out of it because it was a disaster. By the way, if you think I'm overstating this or, or, or opining, go read something called the Afghanistan Papers, which are memos from the United States government that uh, a, a journalist at the Washington Post named Greg Whitlock got through Freedom of Information Acts. They're on the Washington Post website and then he wrote a book on it. And you'll see the dysfunction that existed from the beginning and that U.S. government leaders were lying to us. They were, just like in Vietnam, they were lying, they kept saying, victory's right around the corner. We just need more troops. Uh, U.S. troops were sent into a situation where people know they could not win. And they kept sending resources and, and troops and harming innocent people. <clears throat> so why do I say this? You know, Nicaragua, all these places, the U.S. government has been meddling for long periods of time. You know, this all goes back to discussions like the Monroe Doctrine, all that stuff. It's a long history of it, right? And you got to understand a lot of countries south of the border hate capitalism. They hate freedom, as it's represented by America. And why do they hate it? Not because I think, not because they hate it intrinsically, but because they associate it with imperialism. Because they associate capitalism, they associate markets, they associate what they call the American empire, with forcing things upon them. And then their leaders, who are illiberal leaders, many of them, use that rhetoric and say, see, it's their fault. And it is able to mask the terrible policies they adopt oftentimes. So the Contras involved illegal activity by the US government that was covered up. It involved arms sales. It involved uh, drug, drug sales. You know, you got to go read the history on the CIA and, and the war on drugs. So the, the, the CIA was involved in the heroin, produ heroin production and the heroin trade while they were simultaneously, and, the, and they contributed to, not by literally distributing it themselves, by empowering certain people to bring them into drugs in the United States, which led to the, contributed to the uh, drug crisis in the United States in the 80s. Uh, they did that in order to, uh, manipulate political outcomes in other countries and to reward certain people and punish others. Uh, and so there's a long history of this. So then that comes to the fact of whistleblowers. And look, I understand that there's a lot of debate and tension about whistleblowers. My own view is this. Whistleblowers serve a crucial function in a democratic society. The reason they serve a crucial function is because they reveal information to the public that otherwise would not be available to the public. Now, I also understand the concern which is if they reveal certain information, it can be detrimental to national security. So I'm not blind to it. So to my way of thinking, first best would be if you had a set of channels where whistleblowers could actually report things internally. Those exist in principle, they don't work. The second would then be have some kind of judicial proceedings that would serve to check whistleblowers. So you would take someone like a Daniel Ellsberg and you would say, okay, he revealed this information, and you would ideally need some kind of neutral arbiter, a, a judge, or a group of judges to determine if they were doing it at a malicious intent to harm the United States or because for the public good. My own reading of the documents, in the case of Ellsberg, definitely for the public good. Snowden, my own reading, public good. 
Now, others disagree with that, right? Uh, uh, and there's other whistleblowers throughout history, of course, but that, that's where it comes down on, on that. So I, 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 I tend to think it's a very good check on, on the government uh, and something that uh, uh, is, I recognize up for debate, but an important thing to think about. More broadly, what I want you to, to take away from this is just the expansiveness of U.S. operations abroad. So I was saying, in the wake of Afghanistan, I was like, okay, maybe we'll actually have like a discussion about this. Like people will say like, this went really badly, let's talk about this. But then of course, Russia invades Ukraine and instantaneously the US has to get involved. All the talk about China, Pelosi's going over to Taiwan all of a sudden, and it's like, now we gotta start gearing back up for, uh, 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 to take on the world again. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps, uh, but one of the things I want you to, to think about is when you, elevate the military instrument, when you elevate force as a way of interacting with people, typically that leads to force. Force meets force. Force incentivizes force. For those of you who study political science or, or are interested in it, there's something called the security dilemma. It's one of the fundamental insights in international relations theory, which is that any time one government adopts things in the name of defending them, by definition, it makes other people feel less safe. So I adopt lots of weapons to defend my people. It makes other people feel less safe. So then they start ramping it up. And then you get this back and forth and it kind of conspire, it doesn't have to, but it can spiral out of control. Then you get into really tough situations, like things about nuclear disarmament and so on. Nuclear weapons are back on the table. For the young people in the room, you probably have never really worried about nuclear weapons because Cold War had passed. You know, in your spare time, if again, if you, want to get down for a little bit, uh, uh, not down like cool, get down like <laughs> depressed, go read about the near misses with nuclear weapons. People talk about nuclear weapons like, you know, oh, they're controlled and only, you know, there's the political football that only the president has access to and there's, you know, human beings control nuclear weapons and there have been numerous very close calls which could have led to the devastation of significant portions of the human race. Uh, uh, both internationally and domestically. Like, you know, I, I forget the specifics. There's a case like a plane was flying with like a nuclear war and it just like fell off the plane and landed in one of the Carolinas. Fortunately, it didn't detonate. No one did it on purpose. It just was like, oh, it was like a mechanical error. Uh, uh, there's a lot of close calls. Uh, and so uh, we need to tread lightly. Uh, and and, and uh, again, it's very easy for people to talk tough. One of the things I like recently is Biden's been, the Biden administration's been having discussions, at least that I've read about, with the Chinese government ab about nuclear weapons and, about, and with the Russian government. And uh, uh, again, nuclear weapons, people say, very small probability deterrence. Understand, in order for some to deter, there has to be a threat of its use. And all you need is one breakdown in the chain of command and you can have nuclear war on your hands. So be careful with that. Any other thoughts or questions or anything else you want to discuss? Yeah, hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming to speak. Um, I found it extremely informational so far. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I was wondering, could you speak a little bit to, especially with the advent of the internet, um, the use of misinformation, especially by government agencies in order to um, influence not only policy at home, but policy abroad? Yeah, great question, big question and hard question. First of all, governments have always used this information, always and everywhere. It is not a new phenomena. Everyone's used disinformation. If we call it lying or attempt to manipulate people, that's a, again, a part of the human condition since as long as information uh, existed and people interacted. And so that's not a new thing. Governments try to manipulate and influence elections in other countries. The United States government is not uh, neutral to uh, attempting to influence foreign elections. So that doesn't justify other governments doing it, by the way, but I can understand why other governments are skeptical when the U.S. government either blames other governments or says don't mess in elections uh, because they've done it throughout history and even recently. And they've literally overthrown governments before. Uh, uh, numerous governments, uh, uh, some in close proximity, like in Haiti, uh, others in Iran. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, information's a tool of governments. Uh, internet has ramped that up, and uh, that has uh, led to a lot of uh, discussion and debate, of course. That goes everything from government use to uh, uh, 
private use and, and the responsibility of firms and, and partnerships between firms and private actors. Here's where I come down on this. It's not the only position, so take it for what it's worth and think about all these things on your own. Nothing I say is the final word. These, everything I've said tonight, except for some of the historical facts, of course, are contestable issues when we move to policy. So it's for the sake of critical discussion. Um, I think contestability of ideas is key. So I, you know, John Stuart Mill on liberty is kind of one of the foundational arguments for uh, free speech and contestable opinions, and I think that's right. I think in a free society, you have to have contestation. I understand that means people are gonna believe things that are goofy, uh, that, that are scientifically untrue, but I think that's the only way it works. I th because any time you start pushing back against that, it requires someone doing the pushing back and controlling. And my own concern, and, and again, someone might say I'm putting too much, I'm overemphasizing or putting too much weight on this, but I think it's where I put the weight, is I don't want a government reg regulator controlling information because I don't trust government to do it uh, because of, of Hume's thought exercise. Uh, I, I, if you give someone control over information, you cut off the ability of freedom of speech, freedom of thought in its entirety, uh, and I think those are staples of a free society. Now, I also understand that that places an enormous burden on you and I and others. We have to be willing to be open to different pieces of information. We have to be willing to get out of our echo chamber. We have to be willing to move out of our bubbles. We, people tend to identify with people they identify with, whatever margin that is, whether it's by political party, whether it's by neighborhood they grew up in, whether it's by religious affiliation. We all have different groups. Those are oftentimes overlapping for many of us. But you have to be willing to listen to people. And that's the big thing. And that's personally one of the things, and it's always been you know, contested in politics. Politics has always been a messy game. So it's not like 2016, things just got messy all of a sudden. But one of the things you notice that people are just unwilling to listen to other people. Like in a way that's certainly during my lifetime, they never have. And you have families not talking to other family members because they voted one way or another way. Uh, or to, to people not talking to each other. Uh, and uh, the problem with that, uh, and, and, and willingness to at least threaten violence against people, uh, you can't have a free society without that contestation of ideas, without a commitment to that. And that's a very complex, multifaceted topic unto itself. But that's the way I think about it. Of course, when you have technology, when you have things like Twitter, you're gonna have more media outlets, but you're also gonna have a lot of stuff to filter through, a lot of noise. And so how do I deal with this personally? I try, and I realize I'm a human, I realize I have psychological biases like every person. I try to be as open as I can to different views. I try to read as broadly as I can. But I also try to go to different sources. So like for news, I personally follow a whole array of sources, some that would be considered left-leaning in, in the US, some considered right-leaning, but off also international. I think it's very powerful to see how other people see what's going on in your society. And it's, it's important in order to empathize with people and to understand how people perceive things, you need to try your best to understand where they're coming from. And so personally, one of the things I also do is follow a lot of international news sites. Um, but again, taking none of them as kind of the final arbiter of, of where I come down on things. And I also think it's okay to say I don't know about a lot of stuff. And people don't oftentimes like that. I don't think that's a sign of ignorance or stupidity. I think that's part of life. I wish people said it more. But people like saying confident and concrete things. Uh, and uh, lots, we don't know a lot, even experts. So coming, speaking to you as an economist by training, we don't know what markets are gonna do. We don't know what the stock market's gonna do. It's all made up. It is. People go on TV and they say lots of confident things. They don't know. And then they cherry pick the things that they got right and say, see, I got them right. Well, how about all the things you said that were wrong? You see that right now with Ukraine and Russia. Remember all the experts on the, at the beginning? Russia's gotta run over Ukraine in a week or whatever. No, they didn't. And then Russia started pushing back and then Ukraine started pushing back. And it's like, people just say stuff because that's pays well pays well to be confident, but as a, as a citizen, I urge you not to be. Skepticism's good. Skepticism is not cynicism, by the way. 
Cynicism is like, oh, we're doomed, it's all over no matter what I do. Skepticism is, all right, this stuff we have is really precious. The, the, the privilege I have of, of existing in America for all its ills right now is a very precious thing. And so what does that require of me as a citizen? And that requires skepticism. Uh, and, and so, so that's the other thing I, I urge you to think about. Any other thoughts or questions or topics people want to discuss? Thank you for speaking. Um, this is more so a personal opinion question, and that is with the um, advancement of cell phones, everyone has a camera in their pocket. And my question more so would have been, um, do you think that it's a lot more easy to hold the US government accountable uh, nowadays and that there's a push towards transparency or do you think it's still possible for them to hide information from the general public? Oh, it's possible. They, the, 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 it's possible and they do it. Uh, uh, again, uh, this, isn't, this it doesn't require personal opinion. Uh, uh, again, we have the Stone revelations, but even going back to the uh, World War II going into the Cold War, so there's laws that govern how the U.S. government can classify information. So if you ever heard of classified, this came up with like the Trump, the raids on the Trump uh, on his house with the classified information, right? There's a class, I don't care about the raids so much for our purposes here. Um, but the, just the classified information part. So there's a, a formal process that you're supposed to go to to classify information. That has expanded over time. So now, uh, and, and, and the U.S. government has held many, many commissions on this, and it's called overclassification. They'll say, so much information is being classified now that has nothing at all to do with national security. If it was released to the public, it would have no effect at all, even in the most expansive way you could envision it on national security. It might embarrass some people because they're doing things they're not supposed to do, but that's not national security. The incentive is when you can classify things, you classify them because it lets you insulate yourself from oversight, whether it's members of Congress who Limited number members of Congress have access to certain classified documents, but not all of them for, for national security matters. Certainly the citizenry and Rothschild groups. And so even before the advent of technology that was happening. Uh, and with technology, uh, again, it's a double-edged sword from the standpoint of, uh, you know, it, it brings a lot of good stuff, but government can, you know, the NSA can listen to our cell phones whenever they want. They can access information whenever they want. Uh, and, and there's a debate on this, you know, I was reading a book on the plane um, a couple hours ago on my way here. I got in around three, three o'clock. A book called Surveillance Capitalism. It's by a, a professor at Harvard. Her last name is Zuboff. And she's not talking about the surveillance state. She worries about firms like Google and Facebook collecting data. And to her, in her, to her way of thinking, this is in itself is a very bad thing. Uh, that concern doesn't strike me personally nearly as much as it does her. In, in other words, I. I don't worry about that so much because the, the way they can use information is very different than the surveillance state can. And so it's my concern is the partnerships between private data collection firms and, and the U.S. government. Uh, and so uh, uh, how you get out of this, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot of information you can't know. Uh, and uh, the only way you'll know it is if it's declassified some point in the future, which will be decades, or if someone ends up leaking it, which is the, is the challenge. trustee of the William John Blythe estate. I want to thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Uh, would you care to contrast the foreign surveillance or foreign intervention with the Marshall Plan after World War II? Yeah. So, so the Marshall Plan, uh, for those who don't know, was a uh, relatively large scale, not, not as large as people think. I'll come back to that in a moment. A uh, foreign aid program that assisted with the rebuilding of uh, Germany in the wake of uh, World War uh, and other European countries as well, but uh, in the wake of World War II. And many people attribute it to being one of the driving factors of the uh, success of, of post World War II Germany. So if you look at, if, when people talk about nation building and U.S. efforts at nation building, the, the, high, the kind of greatest hits for them are Japan and Germany in, in World War II, which, by the way, should tell you something. If you're to go back that far, uh, something is amiss. But there's a, a number of reasons these were successful, uh, uh, which I can't get into 
uh, in detail, but I'll say this. The Marshall Plan was much smaller. It was very large in absolute dollar terms, but as a percentage of GDP of the countries it went to in Europe, it was relatively small. There was variation in the distributions of it. And interestingly, countries in Europe that received it later actually grew faster. So there's, an, there, there's a, a potential issue there of correlation versus causation. Uh, and it, uh, you have to control for other factors. So here's one. When the U.S. government sets up, uh, defeats Germany and sets up its military occupying government, it kept in place price controls, uh, which had been put in place by the Nazi government. Uh, and uh, there's someone by the name of Ludwig Erhard, who was the finance minister, and he went behind, Lucius Clay was the uh, general that oversaw the U.S. military occupation. Uh, Ludwig Gerhard went behind uh, uh, Lucius Clay's back and lifted the price controls. He actually, if I remember correctly, went on the radio and said, you know, the price controls are lifted. And, uh, you know, Clay got very angry at this and said, like, why did you do this? And he said, because you wouldn't have done it yourself. And those price controls and changes to the uh, uh, monetary unit, so monetary policy, are viewed as having significant effects on economic growth in Germany. So this is disputed among historians, uh, the impact of the Marshall Plan. Uh, but, uh, and if anyone's interested in this and you email me, I can send you a short book chapter that explores some of these kind of what, what are called, they, the author of the book chapter calls it myths of the Marshall Plan. But even that aside, let's say it had an effect. Today, people like to say like, we need another Marshall Plan. And then they'll insert some grandiose thing. It goes from like helping countries in the Middle East or Latin America or the environment or cancer. They'll say, we just need another Marshall Plan. Uh, and, and that's silly uh, because the conditions that existed in Germany, assuming that the Marshall Plan had the purported effect that the proponents say it does, don't exist elsewhere. That is simply dropping a lot of money into Afghanistan into Iraq, into wherever, won't have the same effect because it's not Germany. Germany and Japan were developed countries. They had the semblance of a national identity, so they were unified countries. There was a war that had a clear endpoint with a surrender. There was a set of occupiers that oversaw the occupation. Uh, there were forces outside the control of people that contributed to success. So again, we tend to look at things and associate always with someone controlling the outcome. Many times there are uncontrollable factors that contribute to outcomes. We just tend to ignore them because we can't, we want to pretend like everything is controlled in a, in a matter of design. And those things don't exist in many of the places where people talk about today that supposedly meet a Marshall Plan. So those are some thoughts. Again, these are, are complex historical phenomena that, that scholars debate and disagree about in history and in other fields. Uh, but those are some other thoughts on that. But thank you for the question. Some of my students have heard me ask this question as we were um, reading your book in our honors option. But I wanted to ask actually about the slide that you have up about citizen ideology being able to constrain, potentially constrain, or one of the hopes for constraining some of these problems that you've, you've talked about. But you also mentioned in the talk, and um, more so in the book too, that um, citizens seem to want a lot of the things that we're getting. We're afraid, and so we want a sort of ramp up of policy. You also talked about sort of moving uh, the baseline of normal and accepting sort of airport security uh, as a way to keep us safe from terror. And so I'm just wondering about sort of the tension between those. It seems on the one hand, citizens are getting exactly what we're asking for in the ramp up of government. Um, so how is it that citizen ideology could constrain it? Or in promoting the idea that it could constrain it, wouldn't it require sort of changing people's decision making calculus and, and forcing them to have something that they don't actually want? Like convincing them that no, you're not afraid and you don't want this, this ramp up. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question and, and a hard one, but I, I, I have thoughts on it. Not so, I don't know if it's an answer, but, and, and everything you say is correct. I, I, ultimately, any society, even the most authoritarian society, is driven by citizens acquiescing. That's counterintuitive to most people. They say, no, the authoritarian regime controls them. No, they don't. Every society requires enough citizens to buy in which is why even authoritarian regimes spend so much resources in propaganda, fear, whisper networks to report 
people that are raising concerns uh, about the regime and so on because they know citizens have the power in every single system. And that, understanding that, is in itself a very powerful thing. So how do I view this? I view this as simply saying, like, look, I think, from my perspective, the costs, which are not novel to me, Madison, Tocqueville, many others, pointed out the risks of centralized state power and war. I think today a lot of Americans have forgotten about these. And I think it's a big cost. It's hard to quantify. Like, how do you quantify your civil liberties? It's not like a tax, like, a, 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 you know, a debt you can measure, uh, uh, money supply you can somewhat measure. This stuff is hard to measure. And so I view my role in doing this and writing this book and talking about this as pointing out the cost of it. Now, what weight people put on that cost, that's up to them. If citizens want this, then they're going to get it. Uh, and uh, they might like that. Uh, that, to my way of thinking, gives up the game. It gives up the game of constraining government. It gives up the game of protecting what I think are among the most cherished li liberties in America, uh, which I mentioned are, are, are extremely rare in the history of humankind. Uh, and, uh, you know, this isn't meant for deter It's not a deterministic argument either. We are where we are, uh, but that doesn't mean we have to be there. I mean, again, even in your own lifetime, depending when you were born, uh, but I think this is in all your lifetimes. George W. Bush starts the war on terror. Again, I, I was in Washington, D.C. in graduate school then. Uh, there was a very strong anti-war movement, a very strong anti-war movement. There were people, not a, quite as strong as during Vietnam, but there were people outside the, the, the White House every single day, 24-7, protesting the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Obama becomes president, gone, literally overnight. Overnight. Barack Obama wins a Nobel Peace Prize, as far as I can tell for not being George W. Bush. Because if you look, what did Barack Obama do? He expanded the drone war. The, in history, there's only one Nobel Peace Prize winner that bombed another Nobel P uh, Peace Prize winning organization. That's Barack Obama, who oversaw a drone program that actually accidentally struck a site where Doctors Without Borders was operating. And that just gets caught up as collateral damage. Some bad stuff's going to happen during a war. Well, maybe, but shouldn't we be a little concerned about that, that that bad stuff happens? It's not like, you know, you lost $20. Uh, these are human beings. Uh, you know, the exit from Afghanistan, uh, it was chaos. And I don't know how many of you paid attention. Again, it was in the news, but then it, like, went away very quickly. So one of the concerns was that insurgents were going to attack U.S. troops as they were exiting. So they were worried. And they got intelligence that there were people carrying bombs to attack the airport. So they dropped drone strikes. They were carrying out drone strikes. One of those killed a humanitarian worker and his entire family, including like nine kids. So it was his kids and family, all innocent. And it turns out, and if you go look at quotes from policymakers, they talk about drones being like a scalpel. Oh, we only hit the bad people, precision. And what did this show? They had cameras from above, which are much better than in the past, but not that good. He was carrying jugs, which were taken to be explosives. They were water jugs. He was a humanitarian worker bringing water to people. So of course, who does an investigation? The Pentagon, on themselves. No wrongdoing. OK, so it's like, sorry about that. Well, what does that tell you? Do you want, think about the image that you want to portray as a citizen and that you want your government to portray? And is that the image that you want them to portray? To do this type of thing and then kind of just act like it's whatever. It's no different than anything else we do. You know, a, a good thought experiment, again, is to put yourself in their shoes. So you have the George Floyd protests. Some of them turned violent. How would you react if Canada flew its military down and said, that's a weak and failed state. We're going to occupy it to bring order to it. How do you think Americans would respond to that? And they started dropping drone bombs on the bad guys and started not just killing whoever they determined to be the bad guys were, but also innocent people as well. Imagine how people would respond. 
that gives you some insight into how other people probably perceive the issue as well. And so we all need to think about that and decide that. And you need to come down on where you think about it on for yourself. But I'll tell you this, if you are passive on this and other issues, and you just say like, yeah, we need to do it, or that's the way it has to be, then that's the way it's gonna be. And that's, it's gonna expand. And things never stay small. You know, Al Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America makes this really great distinction between hard despotism and soft despotism. Hard despotism is the authoritarian person, it's visible, it's the iron fist coming down upon you. It's readily in front of you. Soft despotism is the slow creep. It is the slow entanglement and expansion of bureaucratic and administrative control over your lives. And that's his concern for, for the erosion of democracy. Because it's kind of like, you know, the, when they talk about, well, the frog that boils slowly doesn't know it's boiling until it's too late. That's the concern. You wake up one day and all these little things have happened and many of them at the time might have seemed like a good idea. And that's why even at the time where it's most pressing, a good citizen pushes back. Right now, a good citizen pushes back on the US involvement in Ukraine. Even though people will say things like, you're a Putin apologist, you like authoritarian regimes. You can simultaneously think there are terrible people doing terrible things to other people in the world and question what your own government is doing. And in fact, I would submit being a patriot requires you to do so. Because it is true that other people can do bad things to people and are doing that. But it's also true that your own government can do that. And to just say, no, we can't question it, automatically undermines the fundamental responsibility of being a citizen. And that kind of culture that exists, and it existed right after 9-11, it existed during the, the first Gulf War. I remember being a kid in grammar school, the teacher would roll the TV in, we had to watch, we had to wear the yellow ribbons, and what were we kind of inculcated to believe in from a young age? Everything the US military does is good, you support the troops no matter what, you don't ask questions. And to do so is somehow anti-American. Uh, but you know, for those who know your history, there's a very strong anti-military streak in America. I should say anti-militarism. That's different than supporting members of the military. Militarism is the elevation of the use of the military as a primary function of what your society is all about. That's different than having a military. And that streak goes back to the founding of this country. Uh, now you can say, well, that's when the country was founded, it's no longer relevant. All right, but think about the costs and consequences of it. And I th that's the best we've got. And, 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 and just thinking about that and thinking it through is a first step. I think we're out of time. Thank you all very much for spending your evening with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Coyne will be here for a little while if you have um, questions you wanted to ask him um, after, after the talk. Thank you all for coming.